I'm going to do something very unusual for tonight. I'm going to start almost on time, <laughs> particularly for an event under the, right, that is a, um, a lectureship in Jewish law, a very distinguished lectureship in Jewish law, which I will tell you more about in uh, just a moment. Uh, first, I probably need to introduce myself, although many familiar faces, and it's quite lovely to see so many familiar faces. Uh, I'm Suzanne Stone. Uh, and I direct the Center for Jewish Law and Contemporary Civilization, which is located here at Cardozo, but is a center of Yeshiva University. Uh, this um, very uh, distinguished lecture series uh, that was inaugurated a few years ago uh, is in part one of the sort of tentacles that we um, have here at the center. and. Um, we have a very simple mission. It's to bring the rabbinic tradition into the public square of ideas. So that's a wonderful short sentence, but what on earth does it mean? How do you bring the rabbinic tradition into the public square of ideas? And that, of course, in my view at least, is much harder than you would think. Uh, because the uh, notion of the center really is that um, the Jewish legal tradition, very broadly conceived, so that the word is correctly halacha, um, and all that pertains to it and that is accompanying it, uh, is a, a repository of thought that crosses disciplines. And that repository of thought sometimes needs to be drawn out from the between the lines in order to be able to be in conversation with uh, ideas that are in society, importantly in society, about topics that we deeply care about. And so the mission of the center is also not only to encourage scholars and to uh, invite uh, dialogue and collaboration among scholars who are already doing this work, but actually to train a new generation to do it. And so we have started with a variety of programs, all designed in different ways, to train a generation of um, leaders, thinkers, lay people, uh, to begin to think very broadly and deeply about the Jewish tradition in terms that would also include uh, ways to describe matters in language that might be accessible uh, to members of the general community and particularly members of the general intellectual community. And so we have a graduate program in which we uh, deal with the rabbinic tradition from an interdisciplinary perspective. We have an undergraduate program in which we take uh, undergraduates from Yeshiva University and Stern and introduce them to the many different disciplinary lenses that can be trained on the rabbinic tradition. We have a text study group in which we look at primary sources, but we do so from a slightly different lens than people might otherwise be looking at that allows it to sort of be in conversation with my colleagues who sometimes come uh, and other people. We have a reading group. And we have developed a very bright, vibrant, interconnected community of which I um, am extremely proud of, but also very grateful for. Uh, because in some ways, um, it is wonderful to have colleagues. And it's so wonderful to have colleagues who are not just here, but who are here sometimes in and out, but always in a very sustaining way. And many of the faces in this room actually represent part of that overlapping community. And so I thank you all. Uh, one of the activities that we have is a special one we have tonight. We, we run conferences and seminars and lectures, but none are ever so distinguished as the Ivan Isaac Meyer uh, lectureship in Jewish law. Uh, this lectureship. Right. honors the late Dr. Ivan Isaac Meyer, a lawyer in Germany and later in New York City, who was a generous supporter of Jewish education in the New York area. And Dr. Meyer was a longtime resident of the Washington Heights Jewish community, and he was a leading benefactor of the yeshiva Rabbi Simshan Rafael Hirsch in Upper Manhattan. In 2004, the Ivan Meyer visiting scholar in comparative Jewish law was established in Cardozo in memory of Dr. Meyer. And the visiting scholar delivers 
teaches a seminar and delivers a very distinguished lectureship. We are also honored to have with us tonight uh, one of the trustees of the Meyer Estate, Barbara Ebenstein, who has been a staunch supporter. She is, in part, very much responsible, along with the Bechoffers, uh, for making this lectureship possible at Cardozo. Uh, and she has been really honored, Dr. Meyer's memory. She has attended so many events here, not only every single Meyer lectureship, but other events as well, and has really become um, a, a face that I'm so happy to see. And Barbara, if you just let people, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, we had, this is our third Meyer lectureship. Our first was delivered by Professor Hanina Ben Menachem at Hebrew University Law School. Our second by Professor Aryeh Adre, the Tel Aviv Law School. Today we're breaking, breaking ranks from having a law school professor. Uh, but of course, all of you who are in this room know that we are um, elevating ourselves tonight by having uh, Professor Gerald Blitstein. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about Professor Gerald Blitstein, although I'm sure all of you um, have already seen uh, and know him by name, if not by actuality. Gerald Blitstein is in the Department of Jewish Thought at Ben-Gurion University, and he holds the Miriam Martha Hubert Chair in Jewish Law, and, we, um, and he joined the faculty of Ben-Gurion University in 1972. A member of the European Academy of Sciences and Arts, uh, Professor Blitstein is an internationally renowned scholar in Maimonides' Halachic Law and Philosophy, with a special emphasis in political philosophy. His work in Jewish law focuses on Jewish public law and the interface of law and social ethics. And I'll just put in a rider here that Professor Blitstein is probably one of the people that I most cite to in my own work. And um, from the very beginning of beginning scholarship, uh, he's been a tremendous uh, resource for me. So I'm doubly grateful. Uh, Professor Blitstein is the winner of the Israel Prize in Jewish Thought in 2006. And what I'd like to do is just read to you the citation that was issued by the Ministry of Education, Culture, and Sport uh, at the time of the awarding of this very, very distinguished prize. Professor Blitstein from Ben-Gurion University is the outstanding researcher of rabbinic thought from the medieval and modern periods. And in this field, he has made a substantial contribution that constitutes a radical breakthrough in the research of the halachic philosophy of Maimonides and its influence throughout the generations. In his very accurate analysis of the halacha, he reveals its philosophical foundations and deepens the understanding of pure philosophy. His research into the relationship between democracy and halacha has had a major impact beyond the academic world in Israel and around the world. Professor Blitstein is also, in a sense, returning home since he is a graduate of Yeshiva University High School and Yeshiva College and also holds a PhD and an honorary doctorate from Yeshiva University. His lecture, as you know, is entitled Human Dignity as a Norm of Jewish Law. And I will give you Professor Blitstein one caveat. There is a reception to follow, and we hope to welcome you all at it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Suzanne. I'd like, uh, first of all, to thank as well Cardozo Law School for having me here to give this lecture and to teach the course that I'm teaching at the law school. I'd like to thank, naturally, uh, the Myers Fund for sponsoring this lectureship and for inviting me to take part in it. I'd like to thank uh, Suzanne Stone for all the arrangements that she's made over the last year and a half in bringing this to fruition. And I'd like to thank, as well, these bodies for making it possible for me to see so many old friends. I doubt that that could have been engineered in any way other than doing this this evening. So uh, from that point of view, I'm doubly, I'm doubly grateful. Now, human dignity as a norm in Jewish law. How does human dignity as a value function in a legal system, or in a culture for that matter? How do we identify norms and standards sensitive to human dignity? 
not only in human culture generally, but in Jewish culture specifically. Concomitantly, what are the limits of human dignity within a normative system? Human dignity in Jewish law and Judaism should not be limited to those instances where the term dignity is used explicitly. And I refer as well to terms like honor and glory, and I'm not going to get into the semantics of what's the difference between dignity and honor and glory. I'll just use the term dignity, and I'll say to begin with that human dignity should not be limited to those instances where the term dignity is found explicitly in the text. We recall the prayer at the close of Yom Kippur, in which the sentence, and I quote, man differs not at all from the beast, for all is vanity, is immediately followed with God, you have set man aside from the outset and appointed him to stand before you. A breathtaking existential juxtaposition. Ultimately, both judgments, that of the person's essential nullity and that of his or her essential significance, are triggered by the dignity of standing in the presence of God. So the absence of the term dignity or of any similar Hebrew term from the creation narrative does not imply the absence of the concept. On the contrary, man and woman are made in the image of God. That is an inherently daring symbol of dignity, a metaphor which has resonated throughout the entire Western tradition. It is fairly well accepted now that the original image of God, the metaphor image of God, referred in the ancient Near East to the king alone. So the biblical assertion that Adam and Eve, the person per se, were created in the image is itself a revolutionary democratizing motif. From the king is image of God, the Bible moves us to each man and woman are the image of God. And this metaphor of the image bears normative significance too. For we read in Genesis 9, that whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. As a result of being created in the image, man's death does not go unnoticed, and he who murders himself will be killed. That is the normative significance of the idea of the image, and we are talking tonight, after all, about the idea of human dignity in Jewish law. The image of God in man forbids destruction of the person, and the image of God in man not only protects, it also empowers to rule nature and even to shed the blood of the murderer. This uniqueness of human life is the basis of the refusal of biblical law, uniquely among all other ancient codes, as Moshe Greenberg showed, to allow monetary compensation for any act of murder. The seemingly barbaric eye for an eye is a more egalitarian solution than payment for bodily loss. Usually an eye for an eye is seen as a fairly primitive kind of device, at least as a solution for this sort of problem. Uh, what Greenberg argues is that despite the fact that Jewish law ultimately will say not an eye for an eye but compensation and not a soul for a soul in, any, in, in many cases, an eye for an eye is simply more egalitarian and more ethical than taking the monetary payment. Monetary payments generally in law favor the rich because the same amount of money paid by the rich man really means much less to him than that amount of money paid by the poor. So compensation sounds a bit more sophisticated and, and uh, merciful, but in any case, it's not an egalitarian way of doing things. An eye for an eye is very egalitarian. It may have other disadvantages, but certainly from the point of view of human dignity, an eye for an eye says much more than the payment of money. In any case, Moshe Greenberg showed that the Bible was the only system, uniquely among all other ancient codes, to allow monetary compensation for an act of murder. The similarly barbaric, seemingly barbaric eye for an eye is a more egalitarian solution, Greenberg argued, than payment for bodily loss. Even if the Torah punishes the murderer out of respect for God, whose image, man, has been destroyed, as Yair Loberbaum has recently read the biblical text, it remains the case that the human being represents the divine, so to speak, and being declared the divine icon implies human dignity. While it may be difficult to detail the actual impact this concept of the image of man has had on normative Judaism, the verse, when God created man, he made man in the likeness of God, Genesis 5, was declared by Ben Azai to be the great rule of the Torah. 
Some religionists and secularists alike, both overly doctrinaire to my way of thinking, have distinguished sharply between the various narratives in which the idea of human dignity is rooted. Human dignity derives from God in the religious tradition and from humanity itself in the secular tradition. And we are often led to the claim that each perspective on dignity brings us inexorably to different results. The religionist, for example, will claim, to give perhaps a trivial example, that tattooing the body violates the idea of human dignity, while the liberal humanist will claim that it is an expression of human freedom inherent in the dignity of the person, and so on. Yet the unbounded libertarian perspective is not the only secular view of dignity. And on the other hand, the usage briot, creatures, in the phrase quod habriot, the dignity of the creature, the dignity of man and woman, need not be read polemically asserting the creatureliness and createdness of the person with its theological implications as I shall see, as I shall show. There's a great deal of effort put by many writers when they discuss the phrase uh, quod habriot, the honor of the creature, to say, well, here man isn't being called man, he's being called creature, in order to remind us that man is created and his createdness is the source of his dignity. I tend to find that a religious polemic, which I don't really think is necessarily uh, accurate or, or true. I'll get into that a bit more later on. I prefer to read the phrase briot as creating an oxymoron, asserting that kavod, that most non-egalitarian of concepts, honor and dignity, is bestowed upon all human beings. Therefore, quote, which is honor, which one tends to think of as something awarded only to the special, is given to all briot, all men and women who are naturally created and who are naturally equal by virtue of that creation. Thus, Maimonides insists on the universal quality of the dignity of the creature by stating that quote habriot obliges us not only with regard Jews, but with regard Gentiles as well. At the same time, we candidly admit that secularists and religionists may be divided over the degree of egalitarianism implicit in human dignity. Questions of women's rights come to mind, but the topic also touches on other issues. Another instance where human dignity is asserted, though the terminology's absence, is uh, tort law. Rabbinic tort law requires fivefold composition. Despite the biblical ideal of talio described above, an eye for an eye, rabbinic law says something else. There's fivefold compensation, um, compensation for the cost of medical treatment, compensation for the loss of working days, these two are biblical naturally, compensation for the pain suffered by the plaintiff, compensation for the actual physical damage done to his body, and compensation for his shame, or what is called bullshit. This last principle, that compensation is due for shame, naturally leads to much Talmudic discussion. How is shame to be merit, measured? What sorts of shame require compensation? Is shame an egalitarian concept? And so on. But all of these pale before the very assertion that the act of shaming your fellow is not only forbidden, otherwise there would be no compensation, but even requires payment. We are all familiar with the Agatic assertion that to shame your fellow in public is the moral equivalent of murdering him. Here we see the sensitivity functioning in the legal context as well. And again, without the discourse of dignity being explicit, the Bible itself explained that it is forbidden to take, to take corporal punishment beyond its legitimate moderate bounds as that would lead to the extreme shaming of the person so punished. And I quote, lest being flogged further to excess, your brother be degraded before your eyes. Now, despite the powerful biblical thrust to urge the Jew to abide by the law, public shame may not be used as an instrument to bring this about. Reprove your neighbor to be sure, but incur no guilt because of him, which is taken to mean do not shame him in the act of reproving him. Religionists and people of principle in general have a tendency to overlook human dignity when toiling in the vineyard of the Lord. Somehow toiling in the vineyard of the Lord is often taken as a general, uh, what should one say, principle of permissiveness to slightly forget uh, the, those others who also work in the vineyard of the Lord. But despite the sensitivity, 
Biblical law is willing to use the moderate shaming of the person as a legitimate penalty, a fact which opens up the entire topic of biblical penology. Flogging is a canonical punishment, so we must admit that shame is a legitimate component of punishment. Similarly, the woman whose brother-in-law refuses to marry her in a lover in marriage is instructed to spit in his face before the tribunal. Nothing if not an act of public shaming. Talmudic culture continues to approve of shaming not only as punishment, but also as a way of applying pressure on the recalcitrant to fulfill his or her responsibilities, even when not compelled by strict law, such as in certain cases of support of children and of parents. All in all, shaming, not as an act to be piously avoided, as is usually treated, but also as an act to be exploited, requires more thought. This is not merely an ancient or medieval perspective, but is increasingly visible in modern penology as well. Paradoxically, the individual sensitivity to shame, its very efficacy as punishment and deterrence, highlights the significance of dignity and the price paid, especially, it has been argued, by the white-collar criminal who is made to suffer the indignity of shame. As Posner has written, and I don't mean Richard Posner, but uh, Eric Posner, as Posner has written, people care deeply about their reputations. Therefore, the government can exploit this concern and the fact that reputations do matter in daily life by destroying people's reputations rather than by punishing them in a traditional way. Shame in a social context may even make monetary compensation and physical punishment superfluous. The public listing by name of persons who violate communal norms is probably a powerful deterrent. Eric Posner has argued that even traditional punishments such as imprisonment and corporal punishment are fundamentally acts of shaming. From this point of view, shaming is a weapon wielded by communities as well as by governments. Human dignity is probably what is meant by the Hebrew phrase kvod habriot, which I've mentioned before, the honor of the creatures which translated literally would be rendered the dignity of the creatures, those created by God. So we have once again returned to the theological. But I very much doubt, as I pointed out earlier, that this creaturely loca locution constructed in Talmudic times was intended as an explicit rejection of a secular humanistic grounding of human dignity, so to speak. Such reading would be both inaccurate and anachronistic. One didn't have to remind people in the ancient world and certainly one didn't have to remind Jews in Talmudic times that men and women were created by God. There would be no point of specifying uh, the dignity of the creatures so as to say that, as that human dignity which is so to speak generated by the fact that men and women are created by God. I don't think that would be the point. I think that would be anachronistic. I think we'd be inaccurate. The basic intention of the phrase, I think, was to establish the equality of all humans who are all equally creatures and all of whose dignity should be protected. The phrase is meant to shock. Kavod in Hebrew is always a matter of hierarchical social status, but when yoked to creatures, it announces the special status of all. Needless to say, kavod is usually possessed by God in the Hebrew Bible, but here in this Talmudic phrase, it is most strikingly bestowed on his creatures created in his image. I would also suggest that briot, or creatures, specifically signifies the other with whom we share creatureliness, because we and the other are all equally creatures. creatures. Uh, this despite the fact that the Talmudic discussions of Kvod Habriot usually stress the person's right to defend his own dignity and physical integrity. But I am especially thinking of two statements in the tractate Avot, the first reads in translation, who is honored? He who honors the creatures. Ezehu mechubad hamechabedet habriot. You have exactly the phrase that we've been talking about, which really means that one does not enlarge oneself by diminishing the other. If I, why, if I want to enlarge my dignity, the only way is to demonstrate how unthreatened I feel by somebody else's dignity. The person who fundamentally has to belittle somebody else in order to build himself up, in, in a very basic way, not only does not build himself up, but basically diminishes his own stature and status. So one does not enlarge oneself by diminishing the other, but rather by nurturing him. By nurturing one's fellow, 
one nurtures oneself. Of course, this is not narrow self-serving advice, but a description of depth, depth processes in the individual. And speaking in terms of kavod alone, we have the second Mishnah, may the dignity of your fellow be precious to you as is your own. In both these instances, the kavod to be nurtured is really not your own honor, but specifically that of the other. For Avod also says that an excess of kavod, one's own kavod naturally, is deadly and drives a person out of the world. Now, Chazal simply asserted, great is human dignity. I think that was a phrase that once existed independently. Gadol, kvot, habriot, great is human dignity, and used that evaluation to explain and anchor biblical norms. It is very likely that the author of this statement, Gadol, kvot, habriot, and if so, the originator of the phrase, the honor of the creatures itself, was no less than Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai. He explained the biblical law penalizing the thief of oxen fivefold and the thief of sheep only fourfold by noting that the latter, the person who stole the sheep, had already lost his dignity when he carried the sheep on his shoulders and so may suffer a lighter penalty by law. Despite Jewish respect for manual labor, then certain kinds of toil diminish dignity. Similarly, the biblical law mandating the return home from the battlefield of those who have built a house planted a vineyard or were recently married and thereby risked death and not enjoying the house, the vineyard, or the marriage itself, therefore they return. Uh, Yochanan ben Zakkai or somebody else said that these biblical laws were meant to preserve the dignity of the returning coward, along with this cohort of people who returned from the battlefield was also the coward who was entitled to return. And some of the Midrashim clay claim that all these others returned as well so as to camouflage the fact that there was one individual there who had neither built a house nor started a vineyard nor gotten married but he was returning so to speak nonetheless because he was afraid to do battle the return of all the others was simply no more than an attempt to fundamentally enclose the one coward as he returned as well in an attempt to fundamentally preserve his uh, his dignity now this significantly broadens the impact of Kvod Habriot. Here a person is protected from the public exposure of his own character. Moreover, this non-judgmental moral exegesis is extended to the person who the Bible suspects will communicate his fear to his comrades in arms and is therefore allowed to return home, or perhaps even obliged to return home, while his comrades face the enemy. One imagines that this insistence on protecting the person from the social implications of his own character would have many broader implications. In other Midrashim, which are somewhat more playful, you know, uh, the Midrash talks about the fact that the Bible never names the fruit that was eaten by Adam and Eve. Uh, one generally thinks of, uh, of the apple, but that's really a result of uh, pectus and pectin and the Latin word for sin and so on and so forth. It has nothing with the actual fruit which is in the Garden of Eden. And so the Midrash says, well, the identity of the fruit was concealed so as to protect the honor and the dignity of the fruit that it was. There are many suggestions, but none of them reach any kind of normative agreement. Similarly, there are other individuals in the Bible who are not named, and the Midrash goes out of its way to say they were not named so as to preserve the dignity of those, of those people. In any case, this is a Midrashic theme which comes up over and over again. Now, <clears throat> for Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, the law of dignity is valid not only in, in its specific legal context, it is also educational, functioning to teach a value meant to be applied in many other, many other contexts. That, after all, is the thrust of any sentence beginning great is. If you begin a sentence great is, you're inviting people to imitate. If you begin a sentence gadol such and such, you're inviting people to participate. You're not simply make, measuring, measuring virtue, but you're basically attempting to educate and to extend that virtue into other areas of life, which I would assume is what Yochan ben Zakkai was attempting to do. And so Maimonides cites our rubric when instructing the judge to be sensitive to the human dignity of those under his control, instruction whose relevance is not faded. The Maimonidean assertion also demonstrates that human dignity may or must be expanded beyond the specific Talmudic precedent. The Talmud nowhere claims that 
because of human dignity, the judge should be merciful or attentive to the needs of the criminal before him. That is Maimonides, who fundamentally expanded the phrase that's found in the Talmud and demonstrated that that phrase is not meant to be the sum all of the idea, but is meant rather to be an example. Nonetheless, it strikes me that this is a rather weak sort of uh, result, or, or weak sort of uh, situation. We're dealing, after all, in these examples that I gave you, with reasons for laws of the Bible, not with norms. Uh, Yohan ben Zakkai did not establish any norm to be abided by. He did not oblige anybody to do anything very specific. He simply said that the reason for these other biblical norms is a sensitive sensitivity to human dignity. Now, we're aware of that, we're aware that in Jewish law, at least, reasons for commands have a somewhat diminished status. For one thing, you give one reason, I give another reason. None of the reasons really have normative significance. And this is the sort of thing that Yohan ben Zakkai is doing. What he is doing is giving a kind of agadic type of reading, but he is not really providing a norm. And in a sense, although, as I'll try to argue, what Rabbi Yohan ben Zakkai did is something that Jewish law should be attentive to, nonetheless, it is not really a very strong proposition or not really a very strong argument. Um, even Maimonides' use is educationally general, but not very specific. He does not specify how, in what ways, the judge is supposed to take account of the uh, uh, criminal who's standing before him. So I will move on to a second model, calling what we've just done model number one, uh, human dignity as a general educational norm. I will move on to a second model because the Talmud further expands and says as follows. Great is human dignity, for it, for it outranks a negative command of the Torah. Now that is talking business. That is talking business. That is not simply a vague kind of uh, moralism. That is, in halakhic terms, talking business. Great is human dignity. We've heard that already. And then the Talmud ends, for it outranks, it trumps, in our language, it trumps a negative command of the Torah. Now, let us once again be clear. The major purpose of this statement is once again to emphasize how significant human dignity is, not to assert the outranking of the biblical rule. The statement is originally meant as a kind of educational statement. See how significant human dignity is and how we should all be attentive to it. After all, human dignity is more significant or it outranks or it trumps biblical norms. That's the way the sentence is meant to be read. The normative outranking of a Torah command, no triviality, is simply proof of this pudding. Human dignity, which outranks a Torah command, must, in the nature of things, be of weighty value. Of course, there is something typically Talmudic in this normative authentication of a spiritual assertion, right? The Talmud is not willing or not, not, does not want to talk about spiritual assertions about virtues without giving some normative, concrete, halachic basis for them. So this is a very Talmudic way of expressing yourself. Great is such and such because look at its halachic weight. Indeed, this anomalous outranking of a Torah command, which is certainly unusual, which is certainly perhaps even scandalous, apparently overwhelmed the simpler, more basic, great is human dignity. In other words, the Talmud and subsequent halakhic discussion from that point on until recent times, the Talmud is more interested in the dynamics and possibility of an outranking of the Torah command than in the general moralizing greatness of human dignity. In a sense, this fa very fact characterizes the ambivalent career of human dignity in halachic history. At the same time, it may well be the case that attributing the power of outranking a Torah norm to the value of human dignity empowers human dignity, at least in the halachic scheme of things. And it is that scheme of things which I would argue remains central. This not only when the rule is taken literally, that it outranks uh, a command, but even when it has been minimized, as we'll see the Talmud does, and whittled down, simply saying great is human dignity without immediately giving it any operative significance would perhaps reg regrettably signal its triviality or perhaps its inapplicability. 
William James spoke of the death by a thousand qualifications. In the halachic scheme, one can speak of death by no qualifications. Only a norm which has been tested and challenged in the rough and tumble of halachic discourse remains a viable halachic norm, despite the fact that here one is going to have to develop some balancing. So the assertion that the concern for human dignity trumps the command of the Torah, taken at face value, does greatly magnify the significance of human dignity in the Jewish scheme of things. It's normative significance, to be sure, but also perhaps its ideological burden. The belief that human dignity trumps the command of the Torah is provocative, implying that the basic norms of Jewish life, believed to be the word of God, are contingent on their coherence with human dignity and may be rejected if they violate it. The easier way would have been to contend that any fulfillment of a divine norm is by definition and willy-nilly an expression of human dignity, not its violation. Let me expand on that a little bit. I think uh, the shock value of the statement is more easily comprehended if one puts oneself in the place of a truly pious person, or well, let's call him the religionist, um, who faces a question of if he fulfills a divine command of this sort or another, he thinks he's violating human dignity, either his own dignity or uh, somebody else's dignity. And so he goes to the rabbi and asks him, well, what should I do? Should I violate human dignity and fulfill the divine norm? Or should I keep to human dignity and violate the divine norm? Now, I think the psychological mindset of most religionists would be to deny that such a problem is possible. Because one would say that fulfilling God's will is itself the highest form of human dignity. So one would say you can't create a situation where you violate dignity by fulfilling God's will. God's will defines human dignity. I think that could be a very legitimate response, which of course solves uh, all the problems. The Talmud does not take that position very clearly. It does not say there is no human dignity other than the fulfilling of God's will. On the contrary, it constructs cases in which one faces the situation of overruling God's will in order not to fundamentally violate human dignity. And I think even before one gets to the halachic nitty gritty of that sort of argument, I think the ideological statement which is being made is truly remarkable because one is saying in a sense that human dignity exists independent, human dignity exists independently of its theological rootedness. Now I think there's a biblical story which basically makes that very point. This is a uh, story in the uh, book of uh, Samuel. Um, this is a very sad story in a certain way. Uh, this is a story of David's bringing the ark up to Jerusalem. In the course of bringing the ark up to Jerusalem, there were sacrifices and there was a parade. Uh, okay, and David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was girded with a linen aphod, a linen kind of an apron, and nothing more was said about that, or why it's significant how he was clothed or not. And the ark was brought. David returned to bless his household. And Michal, the daughter of Shaul, who was the wife of David, came out to meet David and said, and now I'm reading the uh, translation, how did the king of Israel, meaning you, David, get him honor today? Notice exactly those words. How did he get him honor? who uncovered himself, who exposed himself today in the eyes of the handmaids of his servants while he was dancing. Is this the way a king preserves his honor, kavod? And David said, as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovers himself, certainly no human dignity there. But David said unto Michal, before the Lord who chose me above your father, and above all his house to appoint me prince over the people of Israel, before the Lord I will make merry. That is where true dignity lies. And I will be yet more vile than thus, and will be base in my own sight. I will completely be willing to destroy what you think of as my dignity. And with the handmaids whom thou hast spoken of, with them I will get me honor. Because those handmaids 
Imam I Kaveda realized that what David was doing was being done in the spirit and to the point of glorifying God. And in that spirit, human dignity fundamentally cannot challenge uh, uh, what one does as an act of piety. As far as I can see, this story of David, this ending of it, I did not read. I suppose I should. And Michal, the daughter of Shaul, had no child unto the day of her death. So it's a very sad story for a variety of reasons. But this biblical story would really greatly support the position of the pietist, of the religionist that I outlined earlier, that basically uh, true dignity is doing God's will, perhaps dancing before him. Anything else fundamentally fades into obscurity or insignificance. But significantly, this story does not define the halachic ethic. This story is not quoted even in the discussion of the halachic ethic. The halachic ethic is willing to set up against the will of God, the command of God, that which represents God, human dignity, and claim human dignity exists in its own right and must in some way be acknowledged. How, how acknowledged may be a subject of debate, but the, the Talmud refuses to countenance the idea that because of God's dignity, human dignity necessarily uh, does not exist. The Talmud also does not find a way of harmonizing the two, which would be the solution. Let's say you agree that human dignity exists even in the eyes of God. Still, one has to find some way of harmonizing between God's will and human dignity. The Talmud does not go that route either. The Talmud articulates a rule by which, in certain cases, human dignity outranks or trumps the statement of the Torah. And that, I think, is uh, an extremely significant perspective ideologically. I think it has implications beyond ideas of human dignity as well. It has implications in terms of the definition of good and evil. So I think th th that's a very uh, basic idea which has come up. Talmudic tradition understood our statement as referring to the conflict of human dignity and the application in a specific case of a command of the Torah. It is not re understood as referring to the permanent and general rejection of such a norm. But even then, and even if we recall that the point of the teaching was to stress the significance of human dignity, not to advocate the trumping of norms, that the trumping of a norm was proof, not policy, even then we have a daring teaching before us. The admission that any specific application of the word of God found in the Torah can conceivably violate the standard of human dignity is scandalous. So too is the admission that the way to solve this conflict would not be through a harmonizing of the law with the demands of dignity, but rather through a suspension of the law, if only temporary and partial. Now I'm going to go a bit further into this uh, topic. The Talmuds differ in their understanding of the, te of the teaching, great is human dignity, that it trumps a law of the Torah. The Palestinian Talmud takes the more radical position. It understands the command of the Torah, which is to be trumped, to be a command found in the Torah, and to be, in a sense, any command to be found in the Torah, referring, um, I'm sorry, referring largely to a temporary trumping. Uh, no Talmud would get itself in the position of saying that any command of the Torah can be permanently abrogated because of human dignity. I think it wouldn't want to acknowledge that a total command of the Torah could fundamentally destroy human dignity. I think that would be the, the rationale or the mindset. But in any case, the Palestinian Talmud takes the command of the Torah, which is Trump, to be a command, in fact, found in the Torah and will be trumped temporarily. The Babylonian Talmud, though, understands command of the Torah in a more limited way, referring either to only one single command, the command authorizing rabbinic legislation, or to Torah commands which may be set aside passively. In this perspective, the power of human dignity to trump, its normative scope and import is significantly diminished. It cannot trump Torah law, only rabbinic legislation. One can easily understand the theological basis for this more limited reading, which serves to outflank the scandal referred to above. There are other justifications that are suggested. But be this as it may, it is this more conservative reading of the Babylonian Talmud, which has become authoritative in Jewish legal circles, 
parallel to the universal preference for the Babylonian over the Palestinian Talmud. But as I have already pointed out, the very assigning of an operative value to human dignity, the explicit claim that it outranks even rabbinic law, may paradoxically grant it more weight than it would have as ethical teaching alone. No matter how sublime the disposition of the Babylonian Talmud to restrict the normative potency of human dignity is often taken as a subversion of the idea of the outranking of the biblical command, but I'm not sure that that's what really happened. Now, two further points ought to be made at this juncture. First, as I have already pointed out, the phrase, great is human dignity, can function independently. It can function not in the context of trumping anything, neither rabbinic law nor Torah law. Great is human dignity, as Maimonides took it and took the implications to mean that judges, for example, have to look at the people who, who are standing uh, before them. Put differently, human dignity can or should be a potent value in the many situations, in the many situations where no competing law of the Torah is even found. Certainly many situations do exist. One classic and influential instance is found in Maimonides' code as we have seen. Maimonides urges judges to remain aware that despite the control they exercise over criminals, including the right to punish them, they must not violate their human dignity. While this sounds abstract and even impossible, how is a judge not to violate human dignity? The most invasive act that can really be imagined is any person, not a judge, standing before a judge and attempting to in some way preserve his sense of, uh, his sense of dignity. Even in traffic court, I suspect, you feel stripped of all, uh, of all dignity. So certainly in a more significant kind of a venue. But in any case, this idea may sound abstract and even impossible, but this comment of Maimonides has had no small impact on the way prisoners may be treated in the Israeli penal system. In a well-known decision, the prison system was denied the right to perform an invasive bodily examination because such a procedure was considered a violation of the human dignity of the suspect. In this particular case, the human dignity of the suspect was sacrosanct even in the context of a search for drugs being smuggled into the prison in the prisoner's, uh, in the prisoner's body. So I really can't emphasize more than enough that, that the idea of human dignity, which is frequently narrowed down to the question of does it trump this or does it not trump that, which is a fascinating intellectual exercise, in real human terms, human dignity arises as a question and as a problem on many topics where there is no conflict with Torah law or with rabbinic law at all. Second, a close reading of the Talmud indicates that it is only in the ritual realm that the command actively trumped is limited to rabbinic law alone. This limitation does not apply to matters financial, commercial, to the social realm, to the ethical realm. In the domain of social ethics, what one calls Ben Adam Lechavero, the norm of human dignity trumps all other norms, whether they originate in the law of the Torah or the law of the rabbis or of the community and the state. Now this assertion that in the realm of finances and commerce and the realm of social ethics, fundamentally, there is no limit other than the case itself to the norm of human dignity. This assertion, I grant you, is teased out of the Talmudic give and take. So it can be argued that it is not probative. But Maimonides does include it in his code. Now this would allow human dignity to be a full actor in the social realm and leaves the state and society vulnerable to the values and norms issuing from the claim of human dignity. Naturally, human dignity is itself vague and undefined. In a sense, it may find its place along with other such concepts in the realm of the newly minted but inadequately defined meta halacha. Human dignity is both legal theory as it pinpoints the value embodied by concrete halachic ruling, as Rabbi Yochan ben Zakkai did, while it also functions as a pragmatic rule, directly bringing about decisions as yet lacking in the halachic system. It does have a certain subjectivity to it, a quality generally not appreciated by Jewish law, but it is nonetheless empowered to compel or forbid behavior. And this amorphousness is not unique to Jewish law. Uh, I quote Meyer, the value of human dignity is often presupposed in moral and legal argument, but the precise function of the concept is almost never explained. And what is true of function is also true of definition. The definition of human dignity may also vary from ideology to ideology. Thus, 
Menachem Ilon, the judge who vetoed an invasive physical examination of a prisoner, and I've just mentioned that, also vetoed assisted suicide as a violation of human dignity. Human dignity, he argued, mandates the preservation of the image of God, not its destruction. Human dignity may then limit human autonomy. It may turn out to be one of those concepts which limit human expression in the interest of other values. Many contemporary libertarians would take human dignity to be a concept embodying, not limiting human autonomy. To give another example of uh, quote habriot or human dignity as a limiting concept, this from a rabbinic figure to whom we shall shortly turn at greater length, Rabbi Aaron Lichtenstein enlists the value of human dignity to justify his opposition to indiscriminate abortion. Given the tenor of Lichtenstein's work on this topic, it's likely that libertarians would read human dignity as allowing a more permissive policy. But in both these cases, suicide and abortion, it is not necessarily the case that a libertarian would disagree. Similarly, disagreement as to the meaning, scope, and power of human dignity may arise within the halachic community as well as between it and that of the libertarians. My point is that we cannot assume that libertarians and halachists will necessarily be at odds with regards any and all applications of human dignity. The delicacy of dignity may be raised in some very domestic, non-dramatic situations that somehow make their way into normative discussions. The response of Khatam Sofer is 19th century, poses the problem of a son whose parents are in economic straits. They are honored persons, and I quote the tshuva, or the question, of distinguished lineage and cannot take their sustenance from charity. Their dignity would be affronted if they went to the normal charity fund to be supported. And that is due to their familial status, a matter of dignity, a matter of perhaps of unegalitarian dignity, but nonetheless a matter of dignity. Should they be expected to take help from charity anyhow, foregoing their dignity? In this particular situation, uh, the son was not asked to make the sacrifice of supporting his parents beyond his normal contribution to charity. This fact may have made it possible to accept the parents' rationale for not taking public charity. Yet the question does, of course, rear its head. Supposing the parental sensitivity to their honor also placed the burden of support on the son, what then? Is the sensitivity misplaced? Let the parents forego some of their dignity and take the money which is available for the poor and the indigent? Or should they basically place the burden on the son? What then? Is the sensitivity misplaced, considering its price, or not? So that dignity is often differential. Uh, dignity may not only be egalitarian. Now, despite its clear mandate, the rubric, great is human dignity, and especially its full form, for it trumps the command of the Torah, does not function in a broad range of instances in the Talmud or in later Jewish ethical or legal discussion. May one, one may identify the Babylonian Talmud with its restrictive reading of great is human dignity for it trumps the command of the Torah as the ultimate author of this restrictive policy. The rule is usually used to protect the individual against shame caused by bodily exposure. Certainly the significance, and hence the prisoner case uh, where an invasive procedure was not allowed. Certainly the significance of this sensitivity to physical shame would not be trivialized, but at the same time it does provide a rather limited range of applications. Despite this Talmudic ambivalence, it is possible to trace broader utilization of this rubric throughout halachic history. A particularly dramatic application of the rubric, a parade example, as it were, is provided in the response of Rabbi Mosa Isserles, the co-author of the Shulchan Aruch, who suffered rabbinic and communal condemnation, both, by arranging for the wedding of a poor orphan girl on the Sabbath against the Mishnaic rule, which banned Sabbath weddings, so as to preserve her dignity. He then preserved his own action for posterity by incorporating it into as precedent in the Code of Jewish Law. The orphan, what was the story? The orphanesses' relatives had reneged on their promise of a dowry. And the groom had basically thereby, therefore said, well, then I am reneging on my promise of marrying uh, this girl who was an orphan. After much sparing, the sparring, rather, the groom had finally caved in and agreed to marry her anyhow. He caved in late 
Friday afternoon. But the Sabbath was about to come in. Isolus, arguing that the girl's dignity was at stake, simply to be stood up at the chuppah, performed the wedding anyhow. Of course, I have simplified. The actual situation, both human and halakhic, was much more complex. Isolus, for example, feared not only for the girl's dignity, but for her marriageability come Sunday. And he also had more sources in his armory. But at day's end, both literally and metaphorically, human dignity played an essential role. Isolus ruled with the significance of human dignity in other situations as well. In modern times, I believe the maintaining of a stable family structure has been identified as an aspect of human dignity. And this has expressed itself in concrete decisions. For example, halachas have advised on certain occasions against full disclosure of information that could destabilize the family if made known to family members. Mobility, enabling social intercourse, especially on the Sabbath, has also been seen as an aspect of human dignity. The person who is isolated at home and cannot move out of his home fundamentally has suffered a blow to his dignity as a human being in relationship to the rest of his community. On the whole, though, the rule was not applied broadly. One modern rabbinic authority, this has been reported in the name of Rabbi J.B. Soloveitchik, has claimed that even when the safeguarding of human dignity is the true motivation behind the ruling, rabbis prefer to cite more explicit, well-defined formal rules, inasmuch as great as human dignity does not only have limited rabbinic precedent behind it, but also because it lends itself to tendentious manipulation. I do, have, however, wish to call attention to a num small number of recent phenomena actually two, which is, I suppose, a small number, or three, which testify to a different climate of opinion. While these may not be representative, I cannot but help thinking that they are significant, reflecting a growing sensitivity to our topic. Rabbi Aaron Lichtenstein is arguably the leading rabbinic scholar of the centrist or modern orthodox camp. He has recently published, after a delay of some 40 years, during which the essay gathered dust, a major paper entitled Reflections on the Relation Between Judaism and Humanism, which deals inter alia with a career of great is human dignity in halachic thought. Although Lichtenstein does not deal with concrete issues, which is really too bad, his paper is especially valuable too to its scope, its willingness to both critique the current situation and to propose new directions and the stature of its author. Lichtenstein's paper first suggests a number of exegetic moves which would enlarge the operational dimensions of the rubric. He suggests referring the more limited Talmudic definition of our rule to a person's own sense of dignity, but amplifying it when discussing damage done to the dignity of the other. But no less significant is his overall critique of rabbinic policy and his overall suggestion for its renewal. While indicating sympathy for the unwillingness to bandy about a rubric which could be used irresponsibly, Lichtenstein nonetheless concludes, and I quote, we have collectively strayed far on the side of caution. This conservatism is not without its own dangers. Elements such as Kvod Habriot are central to a Torah Weltanschauung. Yet the reluctance to let them play that role tends to downgrade their position. The result is twofold. First, and I'm still in the quote, there is a danger that in situations in which they ought to be decisive, they, may, they might not be invoked. The wrong decision might be handed down. Secondly, quite apart from possible specific errors, there exists a potentially graver danger. The centrality of Kvot Habriot as the moral and religious basis of large tracts of halakha may be seriously undermined. No committed Jew can regard such a prospect lightly. Some margin of safety is perhaps advisable, but must it be as large as we have tended to maintain? And so Lichtenstein moves from critique to proposal. We should be well advised, nay religiously obligated, to, re to reassess our current thought and, prog and practice. The price we are paying for caution may be excessive, and in any case, we need to ask whether we have the halachic right to pay any price at all. The concepts of quote habriot and shalom are not personal property. Lichtenstein's drift is clear. The dispensatory aspect of great is human dignity. Its power to overrule other norms should be allowed a much greater role in the formation of current Jewish practice and rabbinic teaching. Um, 
Lichtenstein discusses broad issues of policy and questions of definition as they apply to human dignity and studiously avoids questions of specific application. Professor Daniel Sperber, a practicing communal rabbi and Talmudist at Bar Ilan University, uh, despite his academic affiliation, he is not sociologically allied with the liberal wing of modern orthodoxy, took precisely the opposite path. He based much of a recent proposal to change current orthodox religious practice on the power of human dignity to trump a command of the Torah when he addressed the practice of disallowing women to read publicly from the Torah scroll, a practice largely based on the Talmudic statement that women may not read because of communal dignity, or quote, Hatzibur, not of the creatures, but of the community. Sperber argues in a book devoted to the topic that this practice violates human, i.e., women's dignity as currently conceived. Now, rather than arguing that communal dignity is a relative and historically conditioned norm, which strikes me as the stronger uh, argument, and thus open to reevaluation, Sperber prefers to base his proposal on the power of human dignity to override, to overrule other rabbinic norms, thus satisfying even the stringent rule of the Babylonian Talmud. Sperber's work, which has, needless to say, come under vociferous attack, is noteworthy on two grounds. First, it undertakes a revision of a major aspect of Jewish liturgical life. The gender orientation of the Orthodox synagogue is a clear and powerful reality, whatever its basis in Jewish law. There's a sociological fact there. So Sperber is not rejecting a trivial point of ritual sacrifice. And as he makes his proposal on the basis of great is human dignity, he cannot help but enlarge the significance of this rule in current discourse, perhaps even exaggerated. Second, Sperber operates with a broader use of for Trump's a command of the law than has generally been the case. In general, halachis allow human dignity to overrule a specific aspect of a law, one which only comes into play in certain circumstances. Recall the ruling of Isilus allowing the orphanists to marry on the Sabbath. The Mishnaic rule banning such marriage was not suspended in toto, nor did he say all orphans, all women who were orphans can be married on the Sabbath. He said, in this specific case, when the people giving the dowry reneged and the husband looked like he was caving in, now is the time to do the marriage in violation of rabbinic law. But Sperber uses the norm of human dignity, it would seem, to trump or veto a given law in all circumstances, not only in one specific situation. By doing so, he extends the meaning that traditional exegesis had attached to great as human dignity for Trump's human law. He returns perhaps human dignity to its more sweeping status as a formative norm, in those cases where the term is not even used, but he cer and he certainly redraws the halachic map. I'm not making this comment as critique or only as critique. I make it simply to note an interesting development in the career of this rubric, its appropriation and function. I will conclude with a mid-19th century suggestion, which it is true did not attract adherence or attention in its own time, but resounds differently in ours. I quote from a proposal made in 1855 by Rabbi Israel Moshe Chazan, uh, who is no roaring reformer, the pamphlet containing the proposal I will cite was devoted to a defense of the second day of festivals, Yom Tov Sheni, a flashpoint between reform and tradition in the mid-19th century, and Rabbi Chazan clearly lined up with those who thought that Yom Tov Sheni should be maintained, developed, and fundamentally not uh, disturbed. But he also said, and I quote, it would be proper for all the great sages of Israel from all over the world, men great in Talmud and its laws, great in piety and great in worldly knowledge and the needs of the time to discuss a number of topics. Among them, great is human dignity. Now, Rabbi Chazan did not specify the particulars he wished discussed, nor how human dignity would figure in his scheme. But given the profile of the authorities he gives, a profile which fuses religious and practical characteristics, it would seem that the discussion he envisages would also pursue the renewed interface of human dignity and Jewish law in modern times and conditions. One such ongoing encounter has been taking place not in the rabbinic sphere proper, but in the Israeli courtroom. Israeli law now includes a basic law entitled Human Dignity and Freedom, or in Hebrew, Kvod Ha'adam Notice the terminology here is Kvod Ha'adam, 
the dignity of man or the person rather than the dignity of the creature and from the um, point of view of the Israeli legislator who drafted this law, he was clearly out to make a polemical, polemical point, namely, one does not need man to be a creature of God. It's enough that man is human for his dignity to be preserved. As I say, I think it's sort of a, a bit superfluous, this polemicizing in both directions. But in any case, the, the law in Israel is, in fact, entitled Kvot Adam V'cheruto, Human Dignity and Freedom. Now, this law has naturally been adjudicated in the courts, and the judiciary has had the opportunity to apply it. While much of this discussion has discovered human dignity in the legal and philosophical tradition of the West, note Adam, the person, and not Briot, the creatures, some judges have found Jewish law to be a resource for interpreting this basic law and for applying it in conditions of current reality. For review of this topic would require a separate paper. But suffice it to say that this phenomenon has led to a new body of interpretation of human dignity as played out against the backdrop, backdrop of contemporary times. In theory, of course, an Israeli court does not presume to provide authoritative interpretation of halakhic materials. Yet to the degree that the court does appropriate such materials as part of the national culture, it will also produce a body of legal doctrine which will willy-nilly illuminate these rules and rubrics. It is also possible for traffic to move in the opposite direction. The exposition of dignity in the rabbinic court in the rabbinic court could conceivably impact on the discourse of the Israeli national court. Or is this perhaps an exercise in messianic, uh, in messianic thinking? I really uh, don't know. But in any case, where does, that, uh, where does that leave us? I think it leaves us in terms of thinking about uh, the topic with two points that I think are very uh, significant. First of all, there's a version of human dignity which does not depend on trumping Torah or rabbinic law, but simply promotes and proclaims human dignity as a value within the Jewish legal system, number one. Number two, that there's a stronger version of human dignity as trumping law, whether Torah or rabbinic, on social issues, even in conflict with Torah or rabbinic law. Social issues fundamentally uh, are delivered to the standards of human dignity in a very uh, extreme way, much more so than ritual issues or ben adam lamakom. Uh, and in that sense, the mod we go back and forth between what I call the uh, model one of human dignity as a, as a general rule, and even within model two, a stronger version of social ethic dependent on human dignity, on social issues, even if a Torah law or rabbinic law is fundamentally involved. Thank you.